came in our eyes with this he created a slightly different from what they are. When we talk, we see things are. Welcome to Strange Familiars. I want to thank everybody on their kind words for our 100th episode. A lot of people congratulated us either in emails or in comments in various places. So thank you so much. I'm feeling a little bit better. I think I'm at the end of this Fay flu, getting back into the swing of things here. Tonight we're going to be talking with James, who was a monk and had some really, really interesting sleep paralysis-related experiences, and a possible flannel man encounter, which may or may not be related. After we hear James' story, we'll come back, and I will read a very strange familiar's ghost story, which also includes a monk, a woodsman, and a black dog. Before we hear my interview with James, though, I do want to thank our patrons. Strange Familiars is brought to you by our patrons at Patreon, patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. We would not be able to make the show without the help of our patrons. If you'd like to help us make Strange Familiars and you can get extra shows besides, you can go to Patreon and become our patron, patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. $3 a month gets you extra content. We do at least one full extra episode of Strange Familiars every month, and there are other levels of support there as well. If you want things like t-shirts, stickers, pins, copies of my books, go ahead to patreon.com slash strangefamiliars and check it out. If you want to make a one-time donation, you can do that at strangefamiliars.com. Just look in the show notes for the paypal.me link. You can also help by liking and subscribing to our podcast and leaving us nice five-star reviews wherever you're listening. Tonight we're talking with James, who has a really, really interesting sleep paralysis experience, if it's sleep paralysis. I mean, it it almost sounds like something more, but uh, we'll let you tell your story. Did it start at this monastery? It did. It did. Um, so, yeah, I was uh, 18 years old, and it was kind of a long story. Uh, I, I was – basically, I didn't know what to do after after high school, and a cousin of mine pulled a fast one on me. He, he was dating this girl that was – her mom worked at the, uh, a city college over in Oxnard, which is about an hour north of L.A. in California, and he felt like – the mom was owed a favor by the monks. So I was floundering. I didn't know what to do. And um, he got me into this monastery for school. I was not religious. Uh, religion was not my thing. I knew almost nothing about it. But I got dumped off there. And I got in the city college, to a city, city college there. And so I started living that life. And I mean, I won't go too deep into it. But there's a lot of cool things about it. You know, helping out people and, and being there for others. And that, that part I really liked. And working towards a greater good. I mean, religion is still not my thing. But that aspect I really like. So Sure. Um, I mean, it's not that I've talked to a lot of people on the path of monkdom, monkhood. Yeah, uh, yeah. (laughs) But stumbling into it is a really interesting way (laughs) to get there. Yeah, it it just thrown in there. And yeah, it was a... They were based off of um, the teachings of the philosopher Augustine, so it was an order based off of him, and they did a lot of like contemplative meditation type stuff, but then also a lot of like they were very big into works and helping people, and that's the part attracted me. You know, I, was, I grew up very poor. I grew up uh, I'm half Hispanic, but I grew up all on my Hispanic side and grew up around gangs and that kind of stuff, and so it was a big change for me. But yeah, it was a good time. So this monastery was huge and it was new. It was built on like an old lot, uh, an empty lot. And uh, it was half for retired priest monks and then for the new students, which as I was. And so yeah, I think there was 12 of us at the time when I got in uh, of the young guys that were studying and we were all at different levels. And the way it went is you studied for two, three years and then 
if you pass all the tests and you were still interested, they would send you to Spain and that's the next step. And I'll go into that a little bit. But yeah, so I got there and it was it was culture shock and I'm sure it was culture shock for them too. They were almost all Spanish speakers and at that time I didn't speak Spanish, but I, I eventually picked it up. Um, so major culture shock. Building was cool. It was a new building. That's uh, that's one of the interesting things. It was a new building, but it was built, I guess, on old ground as an empty lot from what I'd been told for years. And so just to describe the rooms... They were built like uh, – we each had our own room, and they were built like shoeboxes. And there was a small standing bookshelf, for lack of a better word. It was part bookshelf, part closet, and it right in the middle. So it, it divided this shoebox into two rooms essentially. But there were so few students that we each had our own room. So I had these two – yeah, this this giant shoebox all to myself. And so I essentially had two beds, two desks, all that stuff. So yeah, so it was around 90 – end of 93, beginning of 94. And – I had been in there about six months, and I was uh, sleeping uh, one day, and again, this was all new to me, all this religion stuff, and I was sleeping on the bed, and I was overwhelmed by this sudden sense of fear, and uh, I was on my bed, I was asleep, and I was uh, face down, so this overwhelming sense of fear got me, and I was just scared, and my eyes popped open, and I I, I couldn't move. I was totally um, in place, couldn't move. uh, um, and yet I could feel myself being pulled. And what's interesting, it's not like I could feel myself being pulled off the bed. And it wasn't like something had my ankles or something was dragging my arm or pulling my hair or whatever. It was, I don't know, like all of me was moving as one. And I remember being <laughs> so scared. Like, what the heck is going on? And I couldn't move. I couldn't shake anything. I I, I was trying to wiggle fingers. Um, the only thing I could do is I could see out of the corner of my eye, like peripheral vision. And... As whatever it was started to drag me off the bed, I hit the ground and then I could see a little bit more and I could see like a vague, I hate to use this term, but like a greenish mist. And it was on the corner of my eye, but I couldn't see too clearly. But one detail I forgot to add is as this started and as I was slowly being dragged off the bed, I could hear what sounded like somebody jumping on the other bed. And it was the squeaking, this consistent squeak. And what was weird is the further I got dragged off the bed, the faster the squeaking got. So it was just the steady squeak, 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 and it got louder and louder and louder and stronger and stronger and stronger, and it was a more rapid pace. And then slowly I was dragged under the bed. And again, it wasn't like... Uh, and I'm a big guy. just I'm, I'm like 6'4", way, but back then I was probably about 240, 250. And uh, uh, whatever it was just moved me slowly, and it moved me as one. Again, like I wasn't dragged by a body part or anything. It was just the whole thing, and then slowly being dragged under. And the noise is getting louder and louder and louder and I can see that green mist and for lack of a better phrase I got real religious real quick <laughs> um, so I started praying uh, what little I'd learned some of the prayers I'd learned I started praying 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 and at that point it eased up I could almost feel like the pressure let go and I gained a movement in my hands immediately and I gained movement in my legs and I pulled out from under the bed and I sat down on the bed and trying to figure out what had just happened. And I was dreamlike state. I, 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 I was just in shock. That's the best thing I can uh, attempt to it. And, you know, I'm a very, like, real-life person. Uh, um, I'd seen drive-bys growing up and things like that. And to me, everything was very black and white. And I was trying to figure out, like, wh- what the heck just happened? So, yeah, it was very hard for me to to try and figure that out. And I, I just kept telling myself, it's, it, it has to be a dream. I mean, there there is no other answer. It has to be a dream. So yeah, fast forward a, a couple of days, and uh, it's started to really bother me. It, it, it just, the movements were so vivid. And after it happened, I, I forgot to mention, but I immediately went to bed. I just I, I was kind of in shock, and I went right back to bed. And I think back, like, why? If it was so shocking and so awful, how could I just lay right back down and go right back to sleep? But um, I don't know. I think it was all kind of part of it. That, yeah, that's not uncommon. In all these experiences across the board, it's not uncommon at all. It makes no sense, but it's not uncommon. Yeah. Yeah, so I struggled with that for a while, and then over the next couple of days, I, I, I had told myself it was a dream, and yet ex- the, the images were so vivid, um, that green light, the green mist, or whatever it was, and the movement and the way I was moved and the squeak noise, it just it really bothered me. So I did some research. I went to the library, and this was 93, so there was no internet back then. Um, I went to a local library, and I was going to that city college, so I went to the library there and did research and found medical conditions, night hag, I think they called it, and night, night terrors. And so I was very happy with that answer. I thought, okay, easy peasy, this is done. It was just, it really was just a dream. Totally cool. So at that point, I was done. But again, I, I, uh, I was still having trouble 
trouble with it. And a couple weeks went by, and I was um, on break at school. And one of the monks that I was with, a real good guy, uh, his name was, uh, I'll just call him Alex. And um, Alex and I had a break, and we were together, and he starts telling me this story. And the story that he's telling me is identical to what had happened to me. And no, just to give some background, the reason why he would tell me this is Alex and I, uh, we were both the same age. We were both young. We were the youngest there at the monastery. And we had gone to, they'd have these conventions and we would have to go to and these big religious things and kind of talk about the monastery in the hopes of getting new recruits or whatever. And we'd gone to this one and he and I were both, I was very new to religion. He is not as much as me. But uh, basically, when the priest would go to these big convention things, it'd be thousands of people and he, the priest or whoever would walk around, people would act like they were possessed. And I'm not saying they were, they weren't or whatever, but uh, we had this one experience where the voices and the noises were so awful and ugly. And Alex had, and I had been sitting together. We kind of shared that exper- ex- experience. And we're both like, what the heck is this? Let's get out of here. So we, we booked, but we had shared that sort of this was at one of those. This was at one of those conventions. Yeah, that we had witnessed this these people acting like they were possessed, and and I'm not saying they were. I don't know if I believe that, but um, I mean, the writhing and the noises they would make and the screeching. I mean, it, we were way up in the stadium, and the, the noises sounded like they were right there with us in different languages. And I mean, it was really bizarre. So you know, being 18 years old, it, it frightened me a little bit, and not, and, I, and I still didn't really believe it, in it. But I even so, it was quite scary. So Alex and I had shared that moment. So then at school, he starts, I guess he, he trusted me because we had shared that experience together. He's telling me, um, describing to me having the same sleep paralysis experience that I did. And he's describing that something pinned him down. And he said he, he, he was on his back so he could see a greenish mist, but he couldn't move his head. So I stopped him there. And then I said, it dragged you off the bed and it started to pull you under and you could hear a noise, right? And it was identical. We had had the same experience. Wow. Um, so a little thing I, I had I had left out, a detail I'd left out, the reason why I actually brought it to Alex, I, I just remembered, was what had happened is um, after I had come to the conclusion that it was a dream and I was cool with that, I was cleaning my room one weekend and I went to change the sheets on the bed that I didn't use, which is where I'd heard the squeaking from. And again, remember, I, by this point, I, I was cool with the idea that it was a dream. And as I pulled the covers back on the bed to change the sheets... The top cover was fine. The comforter was fine. And as they pulled it off, the sheets underneath were in a circular pattern as if someone had been jumping on the bed. And it frightened me. I mean, I, how could this possibly happen with the sheets on the top? Totally fine. I'm sorry, the, the, com- the blankets on the top, totally fine. Right. But yet the circular jumping pattern on the bed itself. And I, I, you can come up, I, I can come up with 100 explanations as to what it was. You know, maybe I sat there by accident and didn't even realize and it ruffled the sheets, but not the top. But it was a per- perfect circular pattern. You could see the jumping. It, it even looked kind of like smallish footprints. Just really strange. And that would bothered me enough to make me realize that maybe this just wasn't a dream. And that's when I went to my friend Alex and I shared that story. And he ended up having the same experience. So at this point, we didn't know what to do. Um, uh, we're just kids, but... At that point, we had kind of started to – it opened our eyes, for lack of a better word, and we started to notice little things. In particular, there was another monk, really good guy, just the, the best best guy you could think of, really hard worker, um, just a, a, the individual that you would want to model yourself after if you were in that lifestyle. And One morning, I couldn't sleep or whatever, so I had gotten up, and he was on the couch asleep at 3 a.m. And what had happened was he would go out after everybody was asleep and he would sleep on the couch in the communal room. And then when everybody would wake up, before everybody would wake up, he would go back to his bedroom. So we had tried talking to him about it. He kind of mentioned something was bothering him, but he didn't want to let it out. So um, it was, whatever it was, was enough to make him go out and sleep on the communal couch and then go back to his bedroom, you know, in the morning to get ready for bed. But Whatever it was was scaring him enough to make him get out of his room. Wow. <laughs> now, th- this green mist was it sort of translucent, or did it look like you know cloudy, or or you know could you see through it? Or I could only um, it, it was on my peripheral vision, so it looked almost like a like a haze, uh, like if you're looking through a camera or, or a window um, that gets frosted over, and that frost kind of goes along the edges of the window. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of what it was like, and then that was the green. That's the part that was green. So, so my vision straight ahead was clear, but that peripheral was this, this sort of greenish mist, and it seemed to be moving slightly. And like I, I could see some movement to it, but I just couldn't get a good enough view of it. Right. And Alex had kind of described the same thing. He said it was kind of like at the bottom of his eye because he was on his back, and he said it was more of like a glow uh, to him. 
And when you came off the bed, mm. did you hit the floor or did you just kind of, you know, get lowered to the floor for lack of a better word? What I remember was sliding. Um, I remember, I think, going feet first and then my kind of body sliding off. I was on my stomach, so um, I must have jammed my head, but I don't really – it was a pretty smooth motion. I, um, and I remember as it happened, like there was sort of a turning because it, it, my feet were repositioned to under the bed. And it's so weird because I, I mean – what could have possibly been under there? Uh, nothing, I'm sure. But it was just um, the fact that it would get me and move me into that direction was 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 kind of odd. Yeah, it's really bizarre. And you, I mean, for lack of a better word, you woke up underneath the bed then? Yes, and I distinctly remember both of my feet. And the reason why I remember is I had trouble as I straightened my legs. Um, I had trouble getting one foot out because it stuck because I, you know, I'm a pretty big guy, pretty big feet. And as I was trying to get out, one of my feet, as I repositioned myself, got stuck under there. And so, yeah, it was just kind of odd. So, yeah. It, yeah. Um, and and it just, Alex ended up under his bed as well. He, Yeah, he was much more religious than me. So he said it took him to the ground. And then what, he started praying and it stopped. So I don't think he got as far under the bed as I did. I think that fear – I think he realized that's where he was going. And it, he started that, that praying a lot quicker and um, a lot – a lot sooner than I did, and for whatever reason, it, it, it stopped. And again, like I said, I wasn't really religious, but I'm, I was reaching for whatever I could at that point, and it did seem to help, which is really strange. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like. I think there's an element of, you know, for lack of a better word, belief to this stuff, and it does respond to that for some reason. I haven't put it all together. I wish I knew. You know, I, I wish I had something close to answers. I don't. I've got a million questions. But uh, it, there does seem to be some effectiveness in praying to rid yourself of this stuff or at least to interrupt it. There was like a, one of the little piece um, – because it happened again in, in when I was in Spain, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But in, here in, in, in Oxnard, there was one other event that we happened. And um, there was this one guy. He, he wasn't on the track to become a priest. He was on the track to become a brother. He, he didn't quite have the academic skills, and he – so he was going to be more of like a monk style. Mm -hmm. And um, just, I mean, again, I, I hate to use this term to describe so, but just a really holy guy, like a really good, good guy. Just as giving and as charitable and just wonderful as anybody. It just so good. We started to notice that Alex and I, because now we were on the lookout for this kind of stuff, that he uh, was getting these huge bags under his eyes. And um, he was falling asleep in prayers. And to, to say that is kind of funny. You know, anybody, everybody would fall asleep in prayers at one time or another, but not this guy. Like this was the... This is the Superman. I mean, he was amazing. Just he really cherished those moments. And for him to fall asleep during that time was just not like him. So I tried talking to him and he said that something was attacking him. And when he told me that, I mean, that's so for me, even though I'd had my moment, that's just so wild. And he said it was like a wind in his room, like a wind would shake him and, and move him and not allow him to sleep. And that to me was just so out of the realm of, of ordinary for me. I like just to, to even say that sentence just sounds like in the realm of fantasy. So he describes this to me and uh, Alex and I talk about it. And one night Alex and I were just walking for whatever reason and we heard commotion. So we went down the hallway and we could hear what sounded like things being shuffled and blown about and movement coming from this guy's room. So we knock on the door and he opens it and he looks tattered. I mean, his shirt is like stretched and pulled around him. And we could literally see he had uh, like pages of paper uh, and like little prayer things on his wall. And they were literally flapping oh, as wow. if something had been blowing as we opened the door and like they were settling from the wind. He had like scratches on his arms. And again, that's stuff that you can relate to normal. I mean, maybe he was doing that to himself. I, I don't know. To me, that's the most obvious answer. But for what at the end of the day? that That's what's weird about it. And um Alex and I ended up finding some prayers and we ended up sharing our story with this guy and we ended up getting this um, shirt blessed by a priest and this guy slept with it every night and he said that after that, these attacks that he had, for lack of a better word, had stopped. Wow. That's, wow. That's so interesting. It's so interesting. So did this continue or did something else happen in Spain? So um, after this, I had become a little more aware of, um, of these dreams, and I, I don't remember. I, I could have had more. I don't remember. But so in Spain, I had gone to the next step, and at this point, I was a, a full-on monk. So I had my robes, <clears throat> and I was living in this tiny little town 
basically an, an agricultural village. They grew grapes and, and wines um, way in the, near the north of Spain. And so I was living there in, in this monastery, a tiny little town of about 300 people. And in the, the end of the town was this monastery. So I stayed there and did my studies there. So uh, this one night, very similar to, to the previous one, I was there. And again, now, now I'm in a different spot, different country. And uh, the same feeling happened again. And, but this time it wasn't at night. It was actually during the day, and it was uh, during a siesta of all things. I had eaten lunch and so uh, had the, the afternoon meal and then was uh, taking a quick nap. And um, then it happened again, and I was pinned down, and I couldn't move. And But this time it was a little different. My eyes weren't open, and I was. It was. it this was an actual dream. And in the dream I could see a face, and what it was, it was the Virgin Mary. But she looked – different um it was i i say virgin mary because it's just a woman she was wearing a hood and 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 the, what you call it the the cowl or whatever and um she's looking down and she has this kind of a stern look on her face but she's looking down and suddenly in this dream or whatever it is i'm having she looks up directly at me and suddenly everything goes this shade of red um uh, so her skin color turns red. Her clothes she's wearing, everything just the, and it was almost like I was seeing her in like a portrait. It was a very close up of her face. So she looks up at me and has this very stern look, and her eyes are just piercing, and everything turns this haze of red. And the, the red was so strong that it had, uh, forgive me for being so flowery with my language, but it had almost had like a sound. Like when it switched to that red, it was just a vibrant sound, and it was shocking, and it was horrifying, and I wanted to scream and move, and I was pinned. So again, I started to pray, and as soon as I started to pray, the color faded uh, from her and from <clears throat> what I was seeing, and she kind of looked down and then disappeared. My eyes popped open, and what was I struggle with this a lot because, again, it's out of that realm of, of what's real and what isn't real. But I open my eyes and I'm looking down at the bed that I was laying on and it's about a foot below me. And um, suddenly, as soon as my eyes open, my whole body drops and I hit the bed like a brick. I, can, I hear everything squeak. I hear the bed almost give in because, again, I'm a pretty big guy and it was a decently long drop. So I was I floating or levitating? I don't know. I don't like to think about it. Um and again, it's a memory I haven't really thought about since, well, it's probably, what, 94, 95. But yeah, so yeah, that that happened. I was floating above the bed, and I hit it like a like a ton of bricks. And that was the, pretty much the last really bad one that I remember. Wow. Now, do you have trouble going to sleep? Not to mention that night, but every night thereafter? Or is it just the kind of thing where, you know, well, I have to sleep, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I I still, I, for lack of a better word, I suffer from this thing. Um, so about every two months or so, I have a period of really bad dreaming. Uh, it's every month, every two, three months. And it'll last for a period of a few days. And it's intense dreamings. There is some, I, I don't remember all of them. They're, they're nothing on the level of those. Um, I've even had a little bit of a, again, I hate to sound, because my life is so grounded in like reality and stuff, but a little bit of the deja reve. I've had some of that. Mm -hmm. I've had really intense dreams. Um, I've had the the being pinned down again, the the sleep paralysis, but I don't remember the dreams as much as those two moments. But I do suffer from it. Like it's just, in, I, for lack of a better word, just a period of intense dreaming. Like I'll have these horrible dreams where um, I'll be doing some monotonous task and I remember every moment of it. And the dream will last four or five hours and I'll experience every second of those four or five hours of doing whatever the monotonous task is. One of the sad things is my children actually suffer from it. They both have that same kind of uh, weird sleep cycle. and I feel very sorry for my poor wife. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was just an awful experience that – and it's it's happened so much over the years. Um, like I said, I don't remember them as vividly as those, but I even have techniques now to try and wake myself up quicker to, to gain motion back. Quick. Like I'll, I'll start with my hands and start of trying to flap them side to side and slowly rocking at my hips to try and get my body side to side to snap me back into into full consciousness. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's very weird. Yeah, I've I've read that that helps. Like a lot of people say like start trying to wiggle your finger – and then, mm. you know, kind of move up from there or whatever. You know, there's there's different techniques and so forth. Luckily, it hasn't been present in my life too much in the past 10 years or so. So Wow. I, I, I've been uh, luckily not have to deal with it for a long time. Hopefully won't anymore because unlike my son, I'm not fond of it. Yeah. Yeah. He's, if he's going to experience it, if he's going to be, you know, be able to just take it in stride, I guess that's good. I'd rather have him that way than terrified. Yeah, that's actually a really good um, take on it. That's a really good take. Yeah, because yeah. I'm I keep trying to think like how because my children are, are young, uh, like uh, uh, seven, seven and nine, and you know how do I explain that? Then I don't want to tell them too soon because I don't want to scare them or plant something in their heads. Sure, know? yeah, 
Yeah, I didn't like my son came to me with it like recent. He's wow. fifteen. I want to say in the past year or so, and uh, he's seen some really interesting stuff. And I'm not allowed to. He he said he doesn't want me to talk about it on the show. So I'm like, oh come on, come on. He's like, <laughs> no, no. He so that there is. Not gotcha. mine, but uh, I can say he deals with it very, you know, very matter of factly in a, in a way, much much better than I did. Like, because oh. I was ready to like, you know, try to see if I could figure out a way to help him or anything. But he he seems way more well adjusted than I ever was with it. He says he just kind of sits through it and and kind of observes and considers it an interesting experience. So wow, yeah, uh, that's good for him. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now the last time I had it, I actually I prayed myself out of it. You know, it was it was Hail Mary time, and uh, right. I, w- I woke up saying the Hail Mary into my bed. I was on my stomach, into my pillow. I was saying it, so uh, that was, you know, again it works for whatever reason. I don't know why, and I you know I'm not a super religious guy either. It's just uh, I grew up Catholic, and it's yeah, just same. it's just something I've you know, sort of come to deal with, like, I don't even question, I just have a relationship with Mary for whatever reason. It's just, it it is, you know, I I don't even question what it's about, but, uh, but yeah, I I don't know, you know, the religious would obviously say it's, you know, it's God interceding or something, but for, for those of us who aren't as religious, I can't say why, why prayer would work unless it's just a, uh, an element of belief to the whole thing, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Yeah. And that it responds to it, uh, not necessarily that you have to believe for it to be there, but that whatever it is responds to belief. I don't know. That's you know, it's just a, a working theory I have. When did sleep paralysis start for you? As far as I remember, that first one over in Oxnard was my first 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 time with it. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, that that was my first event. So I mean, it, it I researched. After it happened, I mean, I dove into a library. I, I dug into books trying to find. I mean, it's just in my head the way my brain works. It's there, there just had to be a, a, a rational explanation. There had to be something. It had to be something psychological. And so I, I just dove into the books to try and find that answer. But then as the little bits, bits of evidence here and there popped out, then it just kind of threw me for a loop. Yeah, yeah, it's, and it's really interesting that that other people there were having. Well, first of all, Alex's account where he's had the exact same thing. But yeah. then that that these other folks would have anything at all going on is also really really interesting. Kind of out of nowhere question, but did yeah. did you in anywhere in your at any time in your life did you see a UFO? No, but I. It's funny because you know I, I I truly enjoy your show and um, it, it, there's things that were talked about on your show that helped me and you know to, to to be okay with my own experience and realizing that i wasn't the only one out there that had some sort of sleep paralysis show but one of the i was listening to to your um to one of your your what do you call it the flannel man mm-hmm. ones mm-hmm. and one of the you said that oftentimes people have uh, sleep paralysis associated with it and i was thinking you know i've never had a, a, a flannel man but then also i was doing the math and i i may have had one and it would have been directly six months before i had my sleep paralysis event well, let's hear about this, please. Yeah, so this was in the summer of 93. I was I had just graduated from high school. I had just turned 18. And while I was in high school, I was in a play, and I had made friends with these two dudes that I didn't know very well. We were in the same class, but we didn't know each other that well. But because of the play, we became really good friends. And we had a um, similar taste in music. You know, grunge was a thing at the time. So we had the, we shared this love of grunge or whatever, music. And um, one of the dudes said, hey, when we graduate – Let's take a trip to Seattle. Uh, so I'm in California. I'm in the giant, what they call the Central Valley, which is a giant, you know, the whole center of California. And it's poor, arid, you know, very ag heavy. And we, so Seattle would have been about, it, it was a 15 hour drive for us. So we decided, yes, let's do this. So summer came. It was August, I believe, or end of July, August. And three of us went. And it was great. I think I had $150, $200 in my name. And we went up for two weeks. And um, just being. 18 year olds and one of the guys drove and we took turns driving and we took his car up and we stayed at KOA camps. We stayed at dive bar, or I'm sorry, dive hotels. We just had a blast and Seattle was great. And he knew a dude there that was a few years older than him. I guess they had worked together or whatever. And the guy was going to art school down there. So he let us stay at his place because he was in art school. He knew some bands. We got to see some bands record. I was walking, we were walking to a coffee shop and I bumped shoulders with the dude and I turned around and it's, um, the drummer from Nirvana, what's his name? Uh, Grohl, Dave Grohl. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then Kurt Cobain was standing next to him, and it was the whole band, and it was just like this weird, strange story to tell. And so it was, the whole two weeks was like that. It was just all these adventures, and it was a lot of fun. 
So at one point, like I had mentioned earlier, I was kind of lost at that time. None of my family went to college. I didn't know what I was going to do. And at one point, we're staying at this guy's apartment, and he was way up high. His his apartment was way up, and he you can kind of see the city, and you can see the the ocean and the forest and all kinds of cool stuff. And he's pointing at some forest and says, "Oh yeah, that's where this video was filmed, or whatever." From um, gosh, some Temple of the Dog, or I forget what the Hunger Strike, I think the song was. And I was kind of intrigued by that, and. and so my friends were going to do something the next day, and I thought, oh, that sounds kind of boring. So I said, you know what? I'm going to walk to that forest or whatever it is. So we had talked about it. I was going to leave in the morning, and I'd be, I was going to spend the night out there, and I was going to come back. I had my backpack with me and everything. I was going to come back the next day. So morning comes. I take off. And again, I was telling you, I, I felt lost, and I was really big in Native American culture, and I, I didn't believe in, it in you know anything, but I thought it was cool. And I thought I'd have a vision quest, and I had no idea how to do that, but I was going to try it. So. <laughs> I had some bread, I had a canteen of water, and I figured at the very least I'll fast and go out there and let's see what happens. So um, I take this huge walk through the city, go through the city. Um, it's beautiful. I uh, get to go through these like residential areas, and I follow the path that the guy told me, and I, I'm sure I did it all wrong. But slowly the, the, the city starts to give way, and the forest starts to come, these residential homes, they get more and more spaced apart and look more cabin-like. And, and suddenly I'm in forest, and I, I know I'm in the right place because I see a sign, I think, and it, it – um, and it's beautiful, and I'm walking on this path. And again, I, I don't know if you've ever seen that area, but um, just heavy, thick trees. I mean, unbelievably green. And it was kind of cold that day. And I had left in the morning, and so by this time of day, it was probably uh, pushing late afternoon. Um, I had walked forever. And so I finally get there, and I, I, I'm getting close. I know it because I could hear the ocean. And the guy had told me that the, the, the trees would eventually break, and I would see the ocean. And he said there was some, like, a Native American-type like a museum or something there. And so I was excited about it. But again, it was so thick, it was really hard to see. And the trees were just unbelievably real. So I feel like I'm getting close. Um, and I'm on this path and the trees are hanging over me and a fork in the road comes in. So I'm not sure which way to go. And I could hear the ocean. So I know I'm close to where I want to get to, but I don't know which way. It sounds like it's coming from straight ahead, but I have to go left or right. So I decided to go left. So I start walking and I'm taking a few steps. And then from above me, the road kind of angled up. This guy pops out of the forest and he's wearing green pants and he's got a flannel shirt and he's got something in his hands. And it looks, he was probably, I'm going to guess about 40 yards, 30 yards ahead of me. And I, so I couldn't see him that clearly because he was kind of far away, but he's holding what looks to me like a hand shovel, but it could have been a knife or an ax or um, a machete. It looked like a big knife or a big shovel, a, a hand shovel with a big blade. And so he's, he pops out of the forest and he's walking very quickly, very directly. And then suddenly right in the middle of the path, he stops, um, stands very still, and he slowly turns towards me, and he's watching me. And it's very uncomfortable because hmm. the, the view is going on a little long. Like, you know, when you, somebody's staring at you for that, like, seven, eight, ten seconds, it starts to feel kind of strange. Right. And so he, he he's staring at me for a, kind of a prolonged period of time, and then slowly his shoulders start to, like, go up and down. And I think he's laughing because I'm hearing a noise, but I can't quite because he's a little bit far away, but I'm pretty sure he's laughing. But started with a slow, ominous laugh. And then very quickly, he turns right around and he darts back into the forest. And again, like I grew up around um, gangs and violence. I had some drive-bys. Uh, I grew up boxing and wrestling. So I knew how to take care of myself, even at that age. But it scared me. And there was this really intense fear. I couldn't quite describe it. It was this really, 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 really intense fear. So I turned around and I went the other way. <laughs> so I turned back around and I went the other path. And I was very fearful because like, I thought, you know, maybe he, I mean, he could easily just crossed over through the forest and, and then met on that side. So I was walking in the middle of the road and I was definitely keeping an eye on both sides. And then eventually the, 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 the gets there and the trees break and it's this unbelievable view and it's the ocean and it's beautiful. And I ended up seeing some like orcas in the water and it was just stunning. And I had an absolute blast and I had a great time. And I stood out there and like I said, I fasted and um, yeah, I didn't see anything, but it was, it was awesome. And then, so it starts to get night and I'm getting tired. So I started to walk back and I, Got far enough away, but it was still kind of foresty, and I, I pulled off to the side, and it was really empty out there, and so I pulled over to the, the trees and found a spot, and I I had my bag and pack with me, and so I fell asleep and I tried to decide to get some rest. Um, I slept, I'm going to guess, probably about two or three hours, if I remember right, and suddenly I woke up, again, just this really intense fear, uh, just like my gut was like, yeah, tell him you, you, you need to get up and you need to go. I can't describe it any other way, just this really intense fear. So I did. I trusted my gut. You know, I, I, I was, I was what, three states away from any family. And those guys, there was no cell phones or internet back then. So my friends had no clue where I was. Just a vague area of where they thought I was going to be. So I, I didn't 
I decided, let me go. And so I got up and I walked, hiked in the dark. I just followed the path. And eventually, after hours, I got back to the city. And as soon as I got to the city, I felt completely safe. Uh, I found a dumpster and I fell asleep behind the dumpster. And I probably got <laughs> about four hours of sleep. And I felt safer there than I did back in the forest. So just real quick, the end of it is... So I ended up hiking back to my friends, got back to his place, and it was probably about 10 and 11 by this point. Um, so I get to his house, and one of the guys I was with, he sees me, and he puts his hands on me. He's like, you okay? You okay? And I was like, I'm totally fine, man. I'm, I'm cool. Like, it was not like him. He was very, like, wanted to make sure I was all right, and it was it was very odd. And sitting down, we're eating cereal, and the guy whose place it was, he, he looks over at me, and he says, it's always the quiet ones. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And he, they told me that on the news that morning, there'd been a report that in the area where I was or near where I was, they had found uh, a body and the arms and the head had been removed. Oh. And so, again, I, I always tell the story as like, I just, I, I you know, I embellished a bit. I, I added more the more details, but normally I just say, you know, I went to Seattle, I hiked and, you know, I saw this guy and it was creepy and then found the bodies in the morning. But yeah, I, I wanted to give you the, the whole, you know, all the small details because Again, it doesn't fit all the things. I, I, I still, you know, I think it was just a weird bunch of coincidences. But yeah, it was kind of creepy, and it, I thought it fit a couple of the bills. So I thought I'd at least show. Yeah, the story no, it's day. it's really interesting. Now, did you say he was wearing like like red plaid shirt? Yes, red plaid shirt. And in granted, this was Seattle in '93, so everybody and their mother was wearing flannel. But right, um, yeah, it was a red flannel shirt, and it was green pants, and he had boots on, and I think he had brownish hair. I couldn't see real, real clear. Yeah, he had this thing in his hand. I mean, it looked like a giant, uh, like a hand shovel trowel, is that what you call it? And, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. But it could have been a machete or, or a big knife or an axe. I couldn't really tell. But he was holding it, like, very strangely. And, yeah, it was just very unnerving, for lack of a better word. Yeah, but, oh, no, it's so strange. Like, these flannel encounter. I don't even know what to do with them. You know, some of them, they, right. they, they sound, some of them just sound like, yeah, that could have been just a normal guy, right, who popped out of the right. woods. Could have just been a guy. But the fact that... A, it precedes other weird sleep stuff, and, and B, that just he, you know, he wasn't really acting super normal, you know, in the way you describe him. And uh, like, why run back in the woods? It's it's uh, yeah, it, it's very very interesting. And there was like a real like dreamlike quality to all of it. I mean, I was by myself. I mean, going on this kind of adventure, for lack of a better word, and, and there was nobody there. I mean, it was totally empty, and that was the one person that I saw and. And I don't normally talk about the vision quest aspect of it, but like, you know, to kind of add that to the mix sort of adds like another layer to it, for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder if that's, you know, was part of it. And it was weird because it was almost like I caught him off guard to a degree because he was walking with something. And the fact that he even noticed me and he, he wasn't, he was looking ahead and it was almost like he could sense me in a way. And it was really strange. Wow. Oh, that's really, really cool. So I have a Dave Grohl story. I have to tell it. Oh, since, do you? Since it came up, it's 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 not specifically about Dave Grohl. That Allison okay. loves this story. She got the biggest kick out of this. This was what, what year would this be, Allison? Maybe ninety-five, ninety-six. Yeah, yeah, ninety-five or ninety-six. And my band had been, you know, had just kind of we'd done a few things, and we okay. were in a restaurant. And there's this little kid, and he he keeps now at the time I had short hair and a goatee, so I didn't right. I didn't look exactly like I do now, and I was much thinner, so much much younger, thinner guy. And uh, this kid keeps looking at me, and he's looking at me, and he's looking at me, and you know I'm not I'm trying not to pay attention to him. I'm I'm just you know what we're there you know waiting for our table, and finally he comes over to me. This is after about like just five minutes of him just just staring at me. I want to say this kid's like twelve years old or something. Okay. And he walks up and he says, are you in a band? And I was like, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, holy moly, like people are wrecking. I don't know what's going on here, but <laughs> you know, maybe we have a 12 year old folk fan here. Okay. And I was like, why? Yes. Yes, I am. And he says, I knew it. You're Dave Grohl. <laughs> 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 and, uh, I, I said, no, no, I'm not. And he's like, oh, at that point he wasn't believing me. Like he was entirely convinced that I was Dave Grohl, and there was no there was no getting out of it at that point. I admitted I was in a band, but uh, later that night we happened to walk into a convenience store, and he was on the cover of some like rock magazine or something, and and uh, Allison just started laughing because she picked it up, and, and I did not look unlike Dave Grohl at the time. 
so. that's hilarious. Yeah, I was I was so pumped up. I was like, "Wow, this kid knows me! Awesome!" <laughs> and then it was like, "I know it. You're Dave Grohl." This is my uh, my brush with Dave Grohldom. Now, if only I had the money to go with it. <laughs> yeah, truly, truly, truly. Yeah, yeah. That that whole and that whole trip was kind of like that. I I mean, I know this. I don't tell this one too often, but so we were there in Seattle, and the the guy that whose place we were staying with, he. He had to go to school for whatever reason. So we go with him and we're waiting outside and he, he goes to a classroom or somewhere to get something. And so I forget where my friends have gone, but I was by myself sitting on a bench and I was reading or something. And this guy comes and sits next to me. And so I'm no worries. I'm just ignoring him, just reading my book. And he goes, hey. So I turn around and I look and the guy's sitting with really long shorts on and he's got a flannel shirt on and like a black shirt. And he's wearing a mask. And it's like, a, I think it was a clown mask. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, Hi. And so I continue reading. He goes, hey, I, I'm Eddie Vedder. And so I, I'm like, okay, sure. Hi, hi, Eddie. And so I continue reading. And then he goes, no, no, really. And he lifts up his mask, and it's him. Wow. And then he puts the mask down. And he goes, don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> it's, it's like, what am I supposed to I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do with this. I, I No clue. So we talked and you know, said a few words. And then eventually he got up and he left. And he said he did it because he didn't want anybody to notice him. But – I mean, come on now. Yeah, right? Um, yeah, now you're making yourself more noticeable. That's yes. hilarious, though. I love that story. That's amazing. <laughs> I've been to Seattle. Oh, we were there, and it was before the dot-com bust, I remember. Mm-hmm. And uh, we played a festival out there, and, and I loved it. I absolutely love Seattle. We had gone to San Francisco for the, the same festival a few years before, and I, I remember oh. people said... Uh, Oh, you're gonna, you're never coming back. You're, you're gonna stay in San Francisco. No, I like San Francisco. It was, it was nice, but uh, Seattle, the Seattle Portland area, we literally almost didn't come back. I, I remember wow. we were in the hotel room. It was like five in the morning. We had to leave to get the plane, and we were Allison and I were looking at each other. And I said, "Are we staying or not? Because we need to make this decision right now. You know, because if we're staying, we, you know, if we're going, we got to catch the plane." If we're staying, we're right. staying. And it literally came down to seconds where you know, we had just bought a house back in Pennsylvania. And she's like, well, <sighs> let's go back. <laughs> but we, <sighs> came, we came that close to staying. We just, I loved the Northwest. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't been back since. And I, I still, like, I think about it. And it's just as vivid as when I was there. And I would love to see it again. It was amazing. Well, you're in the Sierra Nevadas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, so the county that I'm in is huge. And it, it's more the Central Valley, but it covers the edge um, of the Sierra Nevada. So, yeah, I'm up in Aubrey, Shaver Lake, and then way at the top, there's this little town called Big Creek that uh, I'm up in there all the time. That's some pretty beautiful country. Did did the uh, fires take out much of that? or uh, A couple of years ago, yeah, it, hit, it got hit pretty hard. It's doing good right now, doing much better than it was, but um, yeah, they, they got hit pretty hard a couple of times, but... Um, yeah, Big Creek's really interesting because it's this tiny little community that's based off of an Edison plant way up in the middle of nowhere. And it's you'll come around and it's all, I mean, it's crazy treacherous, like waterfalls pouring onto you. And it's it it's so high up there and it's so hard to get to. And then when you get there, there's this giant, enormous plant on the water. And it's, I mean, it's, it's if you're not ready for it, it'll actually make you flinch because it's so big and, and, and intimidating looking. But yeah, really interesting place. I, uh, I'll talk to the, the other librarians there, and I get all kinds of ghost stories from there, and some of the other branches as well. And like, I love talking to people, so I'll go to the library and talk to people, and I get Bigfoot stories and all kinds of good stuff out there. So That's what I was I'll have going, to share was, some of those. I was going to ask if you had some Bigfoot. I heard some Bigfoot stories around there. Yes, I, it's so much so that uh, they were trying to get me, to, and I, I really don't know much. I, I, I'm definitely more of a city guy, but they were trying to get me to start a Bigfoot festival in Shaver Lake. Unfortunately, the, one of the ladies that worked there who was going to help me get it started, she switched jobs, so um, I had to shelve it for the moment. But yeah, it's a lot of like really interesting things. Everybody has a story. Everybody has something that they saw, and and I know they use it partly for the tourists, like at Shaver, because on some of the, the the stores there, you'll you'll see some artwork of Bigfoot and stuff. But uh, yeah, a lot of really interesting interesting stories for, for sure. I'll have to come back. I'll have to get some for you, and for sure, I'll share those with you. But um, oh yeah, no, yeah, that's fine. Of- I was I I just wanted to know if you ran into them basically. If you get to meet the public like that, that's great for for gathering stories. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm about halfway done just putting together a book of. I know this sounds really odd, but of like ghost and paranormal stories picked up from from the library. Uh, it's surprising how many like come from libraries. 
Yeah, so I, I think it's because it's a place where people go when they're in need or, you know, there's a lot of motion oftentimes, you know, people are desperate, they need help, they need access, they need something right now. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's sometimes an emotion. But yeah, I get a bunch of, a, like I, someone shared a, don't mind, I can tell it in like two minutes, but somebody shared a ghost story with me from one of the branches out here. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, please, please. Uh, I got a ton of them, but uh, this particular one, um, it was a, a worker actually. And she was telling me that she was in the stacks. So it's this little branch not too big in a little library and she's shelving books and she feels like someone's staring at her so she turns around and there's no one there and no big deal and so she continues and instills that intense feeling of somebody watching her so it's unnerving enough to her that she stops doing it and she goes back and a couple hours later another employee comes back and says i i feel like somebody's watching me but there's nobody in the branch and they walked around and there's no so then this other lady confirmed it that she was also feeling this and they heard like a book drop or something and they went to go check and there was nothing there and they heard it once more again like a book dropped and enough to scare them and so the whole branch knew about this at this point i, th- I think there was like four employees or whatever and this is all in the span of one day so the work shift ends they close the library, they set the alarm, and the girl who's telling me this, uh, her mom's waiting for her outside. So she walks over, gets in the car, and, and mom goes, hey, we, I think you left somebody in there. And the girl goes, no, we shut the alarm. And mom goes, no, I see the shadow of someone moving inside, like they're in there still. And the girl freaked out. <laughs> oh, wow. Because there's no way, because the alarm would have been set off if anybody was in there. But she felt like whatever the shadow the mom was seeing, and it was someone who hadn't been there throughout that day, like a third party kind of confirming it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, that's that's a cool one. I have to put that one down. Yeah, yeah. So so these are all stories that you've gathered that, that happened in libraries. Yeah, just tons of odd, uh, little odd ones, little ghost stories here and there. Um, just weird experiences that people have had and just kind of, yeah, I've been collecting them. So I think I have about 28, 30 stories so far, and I'm just kind of fleshing them out. And I oh, got, that's cool. Yeah, when, so. yeah, when you publish, come back on. We'll talk about it. That'd be fantastic, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome. That, that's, that's a cool idea. The, yeah. Like you said, it's it's kind of this, what's well, the storehouse of information and this kind of liminal place where people are just coming and going all the time. Uh, it seems like a good place for hauntings for sure. Yeah. And if you're ever in the neighborhood, man, please let me know. I'll set up some people to talk to you about a uh, um, Bigfoot stuff for sure. So yeah, that, I'll give you a tour of the, uh, the, the libraries and the towns in the Sierra Nevadas there. Cause like Shaver is amazing. Just so gorgeous. Yeah. I have to do so I, Once I get done this book with Josh, I'm going to set up some traveling, I think. Cause nice. uh, I've been, it's been too many years. And like I said before, when, you know, I toured the country with the band, but I n- didn't get to see anything. I got, I got to see the inside of clubs and, and the ceiling above whatever couch I slept on. And that's right. about, that's about all I ever saw. So uh, I'd I'd like to uh, actually do some little bit of uh, paranormal touring now. So I think I think that's going to become the priority in the next uh, couple years. Here, got to finish up these two books with Josh, and then uh, then I'm going to take a little break and do some traveling. I think. Fantastic, man! Like, say if you're in, in this neighborhood, please let me know. I'll give you a tour and get some people to talk to you about their uh, like, especially the Bigfoot experiences. Uh, there's quite a few in Shaver, and they they love to talk. They love to to tell them. So awesome. Um, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you having me on, man. Um, I have a ton of more stories, so maybe another day I'll put some together and, and shoot you an email or something. Yeah, that sounds great, James. And yeah, thanks so much for sharing your stories. Awesome. Thank you again. So speaking of monks and ghosts and things strange familiars, I found this story of a woodcutter and Ghosts and Black Dogs. This was published in the National Gazette from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on the 13th of February, 1830. The Domburg, an ancient German tradition. There's a note that says, The Domburg is an old castle, now in ruins, situated on the eastern extremity of the Hackle Forest, adjoining the Herz Mountains. With shuddering fear, the wanderer approaches the ruins of the Domburg, Horror seizes him if he should chance to be overtaken by night in the adjacent district. For when he enters the grounds of the castle after sunset, he hears, deep beneath his feet, mournful moanings and the clanking of chains, and at midnight he sees, by the pale moonlight, the ghosts of the knights of the ancient times, who once ruled with iron scepters over the surrounding country. Twelve tall white figures stalk forth in solemn procession from the ruins, carrying a large open coffin, which they place upon the height and then vanish, and the skulls which lie scattered about are often seen moving among the cliffs. 
For a long time, a band of robbers dwelt in the Dumburg, who murdered the passing travelers and plundered the neighboring churches of their rich treasures, which they stored up in the castle's subterranean caves. Several deep wells were quite filled with the bodies of the murdered, and every day some unfortunate wretch expired of hunger in the horrid dungeons of the Dumburg. The retreat of this banditti long remained unknown, for they had shod all their horses the wrong way, and the traces which led the robbers to their retreat directed their pursuers to seek them in a contrary direction. The treasures of gold and silver and precious stones which these evil men collected lie yet in the earthed-up caverns of the Dumburg but seldom is it granted to living white to discover the gates which lead to these repositories, though here and there he may discern the traces of former entrances into which ghostly figures are often seen descending. It happened on one occasion that a poor woodcutter, while endeavoring to fell a branch behind the rocks at the Dumburg, beheld a monk slowly approaching through the forest and concealed himself behind a tree. The monk passed onwards and disappeared among the cliffs. The woodcutter crept after him, and saw him stop before a small gate, unknown to any of the inhabitants of the village. The monk knocked gently and called out, Gate, open! Whereupon the gate sprung open. The woodcutter then heard him say, Gate, shut! And the gate, as before, obeyed. Trembling in all his limbs, the woodcutter marked the path to the gate with twigs and stones, and from that day he could scarcely sleep or eat, so much was he tormented by his curiosity to know what the cavern of which that marvelous gate was the entrance might contain. Next Saturday he made a fast day, and with the rising of the Sabbath sun he went with his rosary in hand to the spot which he had marked. He stood before the gate, his teeth chattering with terror, for every moment he expected to behold a ghost approaching in the form of a monk, but no ghost appeared. Trembling he crept near to it, and listened a long while, but heard nothing. At last, invoking all the saints and the Virgin, he knocked quickly and half unconsciously at the gate gate open, said he, with a faltering voice. The gate opened, and he beheld a small dark passage, down which he stepped, and entered a spacious and tolerably well-lighted vault. Gate shut, said he, almost instinctively, and the gate instantly closed behind him. He now walked forward and found large open casks and bags filled with old massive coins of silver and gold. He beheld so many boxes full of jewels and pearls and precious cups and highly ornamented images of saints stood upon silver tables in the corners of the vault. The woodcutter made the sign of the cross and wished himself a thousand miles away from the enchanted cave, and yet he could not resist the wish he felt to take a part of those superfluous treasures, to clothe his wife and eight children, who had been long going about in rags. Trembling and making again the sign of the cross, he stretched his hand out to one of the bags which stood near to him and took some small silver pieces out of it, he then quickly raised his hand to his head, and finding it still upon his shoulders, with little less dismay, helped himself to some dollars and a handful of smaller coins, and then groped his way back towards the door, muttering over his prayers as he went. Come back again, called a hollow voice out of the depths of the cave. Scarcely was the poor woodcutter able to stammer out the words, gate open, for everything seemed reeling around him. The door opened, and once more finding himself in the light of day, he more cheerfully called out, Gate shut, and the gate closed behind him. He now hastened home as quickly as his feet could carry him, but said nothing of the treasures he had discovered. He went to the church of the convent and offered two-tenths of all that he had got in the cave for the support of the church and the poor, and the day after he purchased some articles which his wife and children stood in need of. He said he had found an old dollar and a few other coins under the root of a beech which he had been cutting down. The following Sunday he went with bolder steps to the gate in the cliff and proceeded, just as he had done the first time, helping himself somewhat more liberally, but still exercising moderation. Come back again, called the hollow voice, and he came back the third Sunday and once more filled his pockets. The woodcutter was now a rich man in his own estimation, but what to do with his riches he knew not. He gave again to the church and the poor two-tenths of all he possessed and proposed to bury the remainder in his cellar, from which he thought to take from time to time what might be necessary to supply the wants of his family. He could not, however, resist the wish to measure the amount of wealth he now possessed, for to count money he had never learned. He went to his neighbor, a man of immense riches, but one who starved himself in the midst of all his wealth, a corn usurer, 
who cheated his laborers of their wages, robbed widows and orphans of their possessions, gave loans upon pledges, and had no children of his own. From him he borrowed a fearless measure, with which, having measured his money, he buried it, and carried the measure back. The fearless had large chinks in it, through which the user, while selling corn to poor laborers, always contrived that some part of the grain should return to the heap. In one of these chinks some little pieces of money had remained, which the woodcutter had not observed while cleaning the measure. But they did not escape the falcon eyes of the wealthy miser, who sought out the woodcutter in the wood, and inquired at him what he had been measuring in the fearlet. Wood seeds, beer, and some other things of that sort, replied the woodsman with some confusion. But the usurer shook his head at this reply, and showing him the little coins, alternately threatened him with courts of justice, and cajoled him with fair promises and pledges. In this way he won the secret from him, and learned the mysterious words. The rich man occupied himself during the whole week with planning how to transport at once the whole treasure out of the cave, and those also which might, perhaps, be concealed in other places about the castle or buried in the ground. He calculated how, when he should have got all this money, he would purchase one acre after another from his neighbors, or wrest their possessions from them by lawsuits. After he should have bought the whole village, he counted on getting the title of nobility from the emperor, and then he was to go on buying estate after estate, till at last he should become a prince. The woodcutter was not greatly pleased at knowing that this wicked neighbor was about to set out for the castle. He besought him to renounce his purpose, warned him of the danger, told him of a hundred instances of misfortune having overtaken treasure seekers, but what power can keep back a miser from an open bag full of gold pieces? By threats and promises, the woodcutter was persuaded to go once more to the gate. He was only to stand at the outside and receive the bags which the user himself would drag out, and to hide them in the bushes. For this service he was to share half of whatever might be found, and the church likewise was to have the tenth, and all the poor people in the village were to get new clothes. So the miser said, but in his heart he had resolved to throw the woodcutter into the deepest cavern of the castle as soon as he no longer required his help, to give nothing to the poor, and to set apart only a few of the small coins to the church. Next Sunday the miser went with the woodcutter, before the rising of the sun, into the cliffs of the Dumburg. Upon his shoulders he carried a large bag, which might have held three bushels, in which were twenty smaller bags, a spade, and a pickaxe. Once more the woodcutter earnestly cautioned him against avidity, but in vain. He then recommended him to invoke the saints, but even this advice was in vain. Internally muttering curses, the miser walked silently beside him. They reached the gate, and the woodcutter, who felt very uncomfortable, but was driven forward by fear of the torture of which the miser had spoken, stood at some distance to receive the bags. Gate open, called the usurer, with a hasty and trembling voice. The gate opened, and he went in. Gate shut, he exclaimed, and the gate shut behind him. But scarcely had he entered, and beheld with devouring eyes all the casks and bags and cheats full of gold, and jewels and pearls and glittering coins, ere he tore the bags from his shoulder and began to fill them hastily. Then there came up from the depths of the cave, with slow steps, a large black dog with fiery sparkling eyes, which laid down alternately on every well-filled bag and pile of money. The head of the trembling usurer grew giddy, the bags dropped from his hand, his heart beat violently. Away with thee, thou miser, barked the large black dog. Trembling he fell on the ground and crept on his hands and knees towards the entrance, but in his anxiety he forgot to say gate open, and called aloud several times. Gate shut, and the gate remained fast closed. Long the woodcutter waited with a beating heart. At last he approached the door, and it seemed to him as if for a while he heard a deep moaning and sighing mixed with the hoarse growling of a dog. But suddenly all became silent as death. The bells now rang for mass in the convent. The woodcutter told his rosary, and then knocked gently on the door, saying, Gate open, but oh horror. There lay the bloody body of his wicked neighbor, stretched out over his bags, and the casks and chests full of gold and silver and diamonds and pearls, sunk before his sight, deep and yet deeper into the ground. Thanks for listening, everybody. We will be back soon with another episode of Strange Familiars. This was episode 102. If you're wondering where episode 101 is, it was a patron episode. 
to get every episode of Strange Familiars, consider becoming a patron at Patreon. Patreon.com slash Strange Familiars. If you have a story you'd like to tell us, if you've encountered something strange and you want to come on the podcast and tell your story, you can email us, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. And of course, you can always find us at strangefamiliars.com. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more. DarkHollerArts.com Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. Go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com for more. We are on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars. There's also the Strange Familiars Gathering Group on Facebook. And you can find us on Instagram, at strangefamiliars. Yeah.